Seth, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Are you kidding? Instant yes. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Zach. Fantastic. I'm so excited to talk about um, so many different things. And I want to gear it towards music because this is a very music-focused audience, especially in Nashville. And I'm very excited to hear your thoughts on a couple things. But first of all, before we dive in, you not many people might know this, which is you actually at one point tried to start a record label. And I think one of your first artists might have been my high school English teacher, if I'm not mistaken. What's the story here? How'd you what how'd you try to start this label? I did start a you record did label. Start I didn't a record just label. try. You made it happen. <laughs> All right. So here's the interesting intellectual question. I'm an audiophile, and when SACD was introduced. Uh, several things occurred all at once. So Sony, as music people know, controlled the patents on uh, cassette tapes. And when the patents started running out, they invented the CD. And they did that because it's a really good business to own the patents. And when the CD was launched, uh, it could hold 72 minutes of music. And the reason, often reported, is that the CEO of Sony insisted that it hold his favorite version of Beethoven's I guess, fifth or ninth symphony, which was 72 minutes long. But if you want to make it fit that much music, you have to lower the resolution of bits. And that's why most people with discerning ears realize that traditional CDs, traditionally mastered, sound lousy compared to vinyl. So when the patent started running out on uh, CDs, they invented the SACD, which is two layers, holds way more data, and sounds terrific. But in order for it to sound terrific, you needed a different way to encode the bits, and that's called DSD. And Sony uh, went to the Rolling Stones and other people and paid them big money to re-release their albums in DSD. And a C an SACD at the time cost 30 bucks. Well, Sony forgot to make a recorder. So all the people who wanted to record in DSD couldn't because Sony didn't make one. And I found this guy in England, I don't know how, who was making a DSD recorder for 5,000 bucks. So I bought one and I thought, I'm going to do an interesting marketing experiment, which is instead of hustling to find listeners for my music, I will find music for my listeners. I will sell subscriptions. I will get people like BarkBox, like go down the list, which is now commonplace to say, yeah, I want a new CD every month and it's 15 bucks, not 30. And I'll trust your judgment. And it was a no brainer if you liked music. Everything about it made sense. So my approach to it was live to two track, no compression. I was going to do the production and the engineering and record it in a church. No overdubs, no retakes, like a concert, but without an audience. Two microphones set up in that, I forget what it's called, method uh, right. to get a really realistic sound field with antique large diaphragm microphones. Okay. Okay. And I went to the musicians and I said, here's the deal. I'm just doing this for fun. You get to keep all the money. I'm not paying you in advance. I'm not doing the A&R thing. It's just, I'm going to make this record. I'm going to sell this record. And if it works, you get all the money. And I ran a full page ad in Stereophile Magazine because I'm good at uh, writing copy. It was one of the most successful ads I have ever run. 95,000 subscribers. I sold 3,000 people out of the 95,000 readers, 3,000 sent me $5 to get the first SACD for free. Five bucks for postage and handling, I'll send it to you for free. Okay, so yes, I did it with, uh, bed, with Beth Rudd and it was miraculous. It's so good. You need to come to my house and listen to it. It's I have so to hear good, this. so good. And um, it sounded good, it's musically beautiful. And then I approached the 3000 people who had gotten a free one for five bucks, which I had broke even on. And I said, okay, time to subscribe. And three people subscribed. <laughs> three. And I'm heartbroken by this. The whole thing falls apart at this stage. So I write a, a handwritten letter to a bunch of these people. I said, look, I'm not trying to upsell you. I'm walking away from this project, but just tell me, why didn't you subscribe? And what they wrote back was a lesson for the ages. Some said too many covers. Some said not enough covers. Some said too bluesy. Some said not too not bluesy enough. Too loud, too soft. Everyone disagreed with everyone. So clearly the music wasn't the problem. The problem is this. Altacockers 
50 year olds, 60 year olds, 70 year olds, people with fancy stereos, they're not listening to music because they love it. They're listening to music because they want to hear their stereo and they need to listen to something that's safe. They need to listen to Dylan. They need to listen to Springsteen, they need to, listen to Neil Young or you know, to Ben Zander performing in Boston with the symphony because they don't want to have to make a judgment about new music. They wanted to buy music they trusted and were familiar with. Right. And that was a huge lesson for me about how we serve our customers and how we get hung up on whether we're making something good when we don't even know what good is supposed to be. Is that like, I think ever since I started learning uh, using Spotify, my knowledge of music has decreased. I think when I used to go to record stores, when I used to buy things on iTunes, I learned about so much more music. I would buy an album. I would then listen to the album front to back. I can't even remember the last album I've listened to front to back. Do you feel this way also? Do you, do you use Spotify or are you purely a physical guy? Okay, so what is the role of music in our culture? Let's go back to 1962 and Sony again, because before then, the only place you listened to music was in the living room out of a box the size of a refrigerator. The whole family listened. Right. And Sony, when they came out with the transistor radio, it came with a headphone, a single earbud. And that meant that for the first time, teenagers could listen to music by themselves. And so the reason we got rock and roll is because it was a form of expression for a huge generation of kids coming up that separated them from their parents. And that led to radio becoming much more of a commercial behemoth. It wasn't just audio wallpaper. Radio was the selection, identification, and viral spread mechanism of what should I listen to next? Because teenagers want two things. They want to separate from their parents, but they also want to do exactly what all the other teenagers are doing. And that's why top 40 records sell so many more copies than the next 40 records, because they were asking Casey Kasem and Wolfman Jack and everybody else to pick for them so it would be safe. And that led to generation after generation of people looking deep into the music, having arguments over which is the best Beatles album and everything else, because it became a form of identity. But now, now that there is no radio to speak of and we have an endless long tail, you get to listen to what you want to listen to. And part of that is, am I listening to the playlists my friends are listening to so I can be in sync with them? And part of it is music is now back to being audio wallpaper because the business model has largely evaporated. The music industry is tiny compared to what it could be because you're not buying records anymore. Someone's just programming how you're spending your listening time. Right. How do you think with like radio, for example? So here in Nashville and country music, it's maybe the last genre where country radio still drives yep. the format. And we live in a culture that's rewarding people who pick themselves and who choose themselves. But in this format, there has never been an independent country artist who has ever made it without country radio. So you have to play to the gatekeepers. Yep. But let's say you still want to pick yourself and, and have that mindset. How can you juggle that when you have to deal with the gatekeepers, but we're living in a pick yourself culture? These are great questions. Um, Thank you, Seth. <laughs> really, really insightful stuff. It, you know, I've been teaching my new book, The Practice is all about the creative journey. And we don't think a plumber is creative. I do, but most people don't because the plumber is clearly in it for the money. The plumber wouldn't, fix your plumbing for free. Right. When we think about something as human as music, however, there are different ways to approach it. One thing you can do is say, I make hits. And if that's your mantra, if that's your goal, then you have sacrificed a lot to the marketplace because the definition of a hit is it's something a lot of people want to listen to, especially gatekeepers. On the other hand, if you say, I'm trying to express myself through my music, you can't demand that they also become hits. And so I think the question itself has a paradox built deep within it. I don't think it is possible to abandon the genre of country music, to form it in your own image and expect that you're gonna have a radio hit.
Right. So is the method, so if you want the radio hit, then you, do you have to put the pick yourself piece aside and say, now I have to sign the record deal. Now I have to, you know, go in a piece to country radio, or is there another method where you can still pick yourself and feel like you're taking initiative? Well, I say this because I work for a label and we have artists that are sitting on the shelf until they get that radio hit and they're doing nothing because that radio hit changes everything. That's all they need. And right. I look at it and I say, is there something they can be doing maybe while they wait for the radio hit? Or maybe they don't even need the radio hit. Maybe now with, I think we're getting close to a country artist who's going to break without radio using purely social media. What can you do when you're waiting for the radio hit? Or, is, or is, if that's your path, is that where you have to go down? Well, I think that what I'm pushing people to do is be honest with themselves. Because if you're busy whining about the system that you signed up to be in, you're not making anybody happy. So while you're waiting for the radio hit, I think it makes an enormous sense to play for your fans digitally or in person. I think it makes enormous sense to keep writing. And if you don't know how to write, learn to write. I think it makes enormous sense to figure out how to go on a creative journey that fuels you and not command and demand that it also makes you money. They don't have to be the same thing. That They call them performers for a reason. You don't want to go to a concert when uh, and have Garth Brooks be authentic and in a bad mood. You want to go to a concert where he's the best version of Garth Brooks there's ever been. That's called performance. So if you're waiting for radio, yeah, don't, don't sit around. Keep doing the work because you will get better at the work. But let's separate out the attachment to the outcome, which is not helpful, versus learning to see the genre, learning to trust your voice and your eyes, that's really helpful. Absolutely. Okay, so I want to talk about The Practice, which was a book that really stuck with me past, I, past when I read it. Like the more I thought about it, the more I was like, this book is actually kind of changing my life a little bit. <laughs> and I'm curious, there's a couple of things I want to talk about it, but specifically, I think you have more case studies, more random knowledge that somehow turns out to be beneficial than like anyone I've ever listened to or anyone I've, I've ever met. And I'm curious how you cultivate that and what your practice is. Does it come from reading a ton? Do you seek out these case studies? You have an antidote to everything. Where do you find these? <laughs> well, first, thank you. Mostly I look for them. My entire career as a teacher has been about noticing things in the outside world that I don't understand and trying to explain them. And if I can't explain them, digging and digging until I can. And most people I'm amazed don't do that, right? How does an air conditioner work? Well, Freon gas is not an acceptable answer. We know that there's gas, but why, how? And make a, an assertion, digger, digger, dig. And so what I will do is I will collect anecdotes that surprised me and then save them for when I need them. And lately I forget them faster than I can save them. Do you them. save them mentally or I was, or do you write, do you write them? Mostly I save them mentally and I should start writing them down. But I say, oh, and then sometimes that will lead to an entire book because if it's that juicy a nugget, I'll come back to it and come back to it and come back to it looking for more that pile on. So in the case of the practice, you know, I love people in the music industry and I love the industry because it's so, uh, uh, opaque and transparent at the same time. And um, collecting stories from people who have done really cool things. You know, talking to Peter Gabriel about his journey as a musician is so different than listening to, you know, pick some other artist who can't find words for uh, their good fortune and refuses to believe it's luck. I mean, all of these things balancing together I think it's a metaphor for how we go through our lives. Yeah. And what I really connect to with the practice was specifically towards guitar playing, which is I've been very frustrated in my guitar playing for years. And what I sort of took away from the practice was the guitar playing is the point, not getting somewhere else with it. It's the point that the guitar playing itself is supposed to be the joyous part of it. And I feel like when I'm practicing guitar, I'm always working towards a song or a gig or something. And maybe that's not the point you use the metaphor of teaching people how to juggle and toss, toss, drop, drop. 
I'm curious with music, let's say learning guitar, how would you ap approach, how would you take a toss, toss, drop, drop model or fly fishing without a hook, as you say in the book, how would you take that with learning an instrument, let's say? So let's talk about attachment. Attachment is a, a, a Buddhist term. And the way I think about it is this, if you and I needed to swim across Joe Lake in Ontario, uh, it's about a mile across and we wanted to be safe about it. We should be near each other while we're swimming. Well, one way to be near each other is tie a rope, arm to arm, arm to arm, leg to leg, leg to leg. We're attached to each other and then we will drown. And the other way to do it is to be aware of where you are and you're aware of where I am and we're just moving together. That's not attachment, that's awareness. So if you're playing an instrument and you can imagine what it is to sound like Benny Goodman, or you can imagine what it is to sound like Richard Thompson, and you don't, don't get hooked on needing to sound like them right now because that's where the frustration comes in. Instead, realize that there is a gap between where you are and where you'd like to be. Understand how it would, could sound different and then say to yourself, can I do one note? Could I play one note the way Jimmy would have played one note? And if you can get there step by step, that's how change happens. And, you know, I'm one to talk. I sold my Godin bass guitar just yesterday. A guitar no, bass. I was going to ask you about this because I I know you've been trying to learn bass for a long time. <laughs> I, but I realized I was intentionally trapping myself because I didn't really want to learn the bass. I just wanted to be a bass player. And those are two different things. And if I wasn't willing to enroll in the journey of learning the bass, I had no right to expect that I could ever be a bass player. Okay, fair enough. And then how would you approach that same thing with like, with building an audience wanting to be an artist? Is it a similar approach? As yeah, I to... mean, so what, what I say to people, one of my most popular posts is called First 10. And what I say to people is, there are 10 people who trust you, who like you, who you could get to listen to a demo, who you could get, to try your new brand of soup, whatever it is you make. If you shared it with those 10 people and they don't tell anybody else and they don't ask for more, you're not good enough. Go back to work. On the other hand, if those 10 people say, is it okay if I share this with someone? Can I read the next chapter of the book, et cetera, et cetera? Now you have what you need, which is people realize they will benefit by rooting for you and sharing your work with someone else. And then it spreads and it spreads. Now, program directors are huge commercial sneezers in that if you get one of those people to like what you're doing, it multiplies times a million. Right. But we certainly see, even in the era of corporate radio, that it is possible to have a song spread the way, for example, Psy did on YouTube, just because humans told other humans. And... Patricia Barber, one of my favorite jazz musicians, sells out every Monday night in Chicago. Now there's only a hundred seats. That's okay. But every Monday night at the Green Mill, there at, when I went, the person sitting next to me had flown in from Mumbai just to hear her play. How did he know to come? Because someone told someone, told someone, told someone. That's your craft. Now you talk a lot about the smallest viable audience and you kind of just mentioned it there. And I've heard you tell the story about how you used to go to, I think it was Momofuku when it first opened up yeah. to get Brussels sprouts and you would ask for it without bacon and it worked the first four times. Maybe the fourth time they said, we serve it with bacon because we like it. If you want to you know, eat at a vegetarian restaurant, go next door. I get your point about the smallest viable audience, but to me, and I know this is just a metaphor of a story, but is bacon really where you should draw the line? How do you know when you're alienating your audience or, or when you should draw the line and say, this isn't for you, or when you should say, maybe bacon isn't our mission statement. Maybe that's not that relevant to what our product is. Come on in. We're going to adjust to you. Yeah. I, I guess it depends on uh, your goals. So let's, let's for our, the listeners at home, uh, smallest, viable, story, yeah. <laughs> smallest viable audience argues that there are no mass market successes going forward if I define mass market as more than half the people, you don't even win a presidential election with more than half the people anymore, right? That if I look at, you know, Coinbase just went public, there were $65 billion. 
How many active customers do you think they have? They don't even have a million active customers. You don't need everyone. You need someone. That is what the argument of smallest viable audience is. So my cousin likes uh, a, a, a musical group, I'm gonna use the word musical in quotation marks, that specializes in playing music so loud, you feel it in your bones, and they hand out noise reducing giant airplane headphones when you go to their concert, because otherwise you will become deaf. <laughs> now, that's not for me, but if it's for you, you will travel across the city to go hear them because you're part of that audience. So that's the argument. Now, where do you draw the line? Well, it depends on what you want. So we have seen, for example, people who came up as Christian or gospel artists say, I would rather have a bigger audience. So they tone down part of their message, amplify other parts of their message to reach more people. They still don't reach everybody. They're very specific about who it's for. So in the case of Momofuku, what David was trying to do is say, this is a special, singular, idiosyncratic restaurant. There's only 25 seats. Come if you want. And kicking me out was a good way to start that process because the alternative is to say, we're a diner. What do you want? We'll make it for you. That's different. So if you're a cover band and you walk into the Ramada Inn where you post COVID, where you get another gig and you just take requests from the audience, you're Bill Murray, right? Go for it, but don't expect to also be seen as singular, idiosyncratic, important, and worth listening to original music from. You can't have it both ways. You got to pick what do you stand for. But is that like Garth Brooks famously at the end of his concert takes requests and he'll even play covers. You can request a non-Garth Brooks song. Sure. And not to, I mean, I get the point you're trying to make 100%, but I'm just, I'm just curious because to me, it feels like the bacon and the Brussels sprouts does not, is not what Mama Fugu should stand for. If that's the make or breaking point, it seems like a loose cause to die on the sword for. Yeah, no, or is it? Well, or is that not the point? No, they didn't die on the sword. What they said is it's not for you. We know what we want to make, but it's not for you. So Garth Brooks takes requests, but Garth Brooks isn't going to play speed metal if you request it, right. unless he's trying to be ironic, right? <laughs> like, I love the covers that Ricky Lee Jones has done and recorded. I think they're fantastic. I love Sweet Jane from Cowboy Junkies. But the point is, Cowboy Junkies didn't become Cowboy Junkies because they came out with a cover album that sounded just like um, Neil, what is, what is his name? Lou Reed. Yeah. They came out with something that sounded like Cowboy Junkies. And Garth Brooks is singular. You can tell Garth Brooks from across the room. And I have a friend who spent the weekend with him at his place. And in every interaction, he was idiosyncratic because the whole idea is this is the one and only Garth Brooks. What If you're going to bother being in the music business and not work for Goldman Sachs, I think you should be in that business because you want to be the one and only. Words of wisdom from Seth. So I want to shift gears a little bit to uh, recording rights. And right now, probably one of the biggest topics is uh, songwriter rights. That songwriters don't get paid nearly, or the publishing is not compensated for nearly as much as the master recordings are. And there's an interesting dilemma, which is that, well, there's two things. One is, I think when people argue this, they always look at the numbers and we're talking, and they're, they're always off by like two points or three points. And that's their big argument. Look at this. We're three points off. We're four points off. That's always the argument that I see. And the second issue is that the largest publishing companies are owned by the largest recording companies. So it's a very interesting dynamic. There's a lot of people trying to fix this. This is something I'm very passionate about. And what I'm curious is with a problem like this, where, we're, where people are arguing with numbers and the companies that need to change are owned by the companies that don't want to change. How would you approach a complicated problem like this? It's a little bit of a crazy question, but how would you think about something like this? Okay, so let's begin with why it's a problem to begin with. The way that money has flowed through the music industry has been super weird ever since player pianos existed. That there are people who will do enormous amounts of work on a project and own a, not a penny of the flow. And there are other people who say, hey, buddy, if you want to be on my record, I, I need to, to own half the rights or else get out of the room. They right. may not be allowed to do that, but they do it all the time. And so what the real problem is, 
is compared to what? That we live in a culture where we have been indoctrinated to be sad if our next door neighbor has a better car than we do. We built that indoctrination to sell more cars. And so if you walked up to somebody at Berkeley School of Music and said, hey, 19 year old, here's a pile of money and a lifestyle if you're gonna start doing this. They say yes in a heartbeat. But the people who slaved and fought and were disrespected and finally got to the other side now feel entitled. And when they see that someone right next to them who appears to be contributing less value is compensated more, it's hurtful. And so they want to fix it because of the story they're telling themselves, not because of the absolute value of any of this. Are you saying like, there's always people who say, I got a hundred thousand streams and I didn't make that much money. And I always want to say, but the truth is you need, the people who are making money are people who are getting millions of streams. You don't have a big enough audience yet. Is that, is that kind of what you're referencing? Well, no, what, what I'm referencing, so if someone says, I got 100,000 streams in their mind, that's a lot. They're on the other side of the chasm. They made it. 100,000 people is more than fit into Madison Square Garden for three shows. That's a right. lot of people. And I only made 48 cents, <laughs> right? That question is a trap, right? That question is a trap. It's like saying Van Morrison's got a bigger private jet than me. Someone's always going to have a bigger private jet than you. The response of, well, let's figure out how to get you to 10 million streams feels daunting because I know how hard it was to get to 100,000 and now you want me to do 100 times more work. And so the frustration at the gap, at the scarcity is where it's being expressed in this way. But what people forget is the scarcity is where the value comes from that back in the old days before Edison, the only people who heard you play were people who were in the room. There was not one millionaire musician in 1850 because there was no one in the room. The fact that now we put everyone in a room and a few people get a big check is what attracted you to this. And the fact that you're not one of the finalists is really frustrating. I totally got that. But your response to them is, if you want to feel the feeling, probably not, it probably doesn't pay to curse out Mick Jagger. It probably pays to figure out how to double down on your fans to get them to tell the others, to earn permission, to be able to program straight to them and leave out the middleman. And too often, musicians don't want to take that responsibility. They don't want to say, oh, I could have my own label because it's way more satisfying in the short run to get picked by the A&R person and the program director and that person at Spotify who puts you on some caviar list. Oh, I won. Yeah, you won the lottery. Lots of people want to win the lottery. I just can't tell you how to win the lottery. How would you, because I see this all the time referencing something you just said, which is I see artists who have millions of streams independently, quite literally, uh, 250,000 followers on Instagram. There's someone I'm thinking of in particular and he is waiting to sign that record deal. And I say to him every time I'm like, dude, why don't you start a label? He says, well, how am I gonna afford it? I said, you could raise the money. People wanna get into the music industry. Nobody, I, I could point to 10 examples of people who could easily start their own label, already have successful careers, could build a team around them, haven't done it. Is that because no one wants to pick themselves? Why is that such a roadblock for people? So we must now tell the Amanda Palmer story. <laughs> so Amanda Palmer, ruffled a lot of feathers when she did the most popular music Kickstarter in history. She made a million dollars up front for a record album back when that had never been done before. And um, she was sitting with me a couple months afterwards and she said, let me tell you about the Dresden Dolls. The Dresden Dolls were an avant-garde duet and uh, they got picked by a very prestigious label and after their second record, they had sold 20,000 copies and the label called them in and they said, look, you guys are a pain in the ass. But beyond that, you only sold 20,000 copies. We can't afford you. And they got kicked off the label. 20,000 sales got them kicked off, kicked off the, label. the label. And so Amanda turns to me, she says, do you want to know how many people backed my Kickstarter? 20,000, exactly 20,000. <laughs> the same 20,000 people that 
that's enough to make a million dollars. And so Kevin Kelly's true fans, people don't really understand what the thousand true fans are. Thousand true fans doesn't mean there are a thousand people who will stream you on Spotify. A thousand true fans are, are there a thousand people who, if you said, I need 50 bucks to make this new record, they'd say yes. Are there a thousand people who would drive an hour to come see you in a coffee shop? Are there a thousand, you get the idea. If you get a thousand, just a thousand. It's enough. It's enough. And if you get 20,000, like Amanda has, you're a star for as long as you want to be. She doesn't make music for me or for you. She makes music for 20,000 people. That is the home run. That's where this whole conversation started with the record label. The, your friend who's got a quarter million Instagram followers, if they're really followers, there ought to be 5,000 true fans in that pile. And if there are 5,000 true fans, that's enough. And I would say, screw the record labels, screw the program directors, screw everybody, own your rights, make music for the 5,000 and do it in a way where you're on the hook and they tell the others. Because if you can do that, you have freedom. And freedom is one of the things that creatives need more than anything. How do you cultivate that? Because the last thing the world needs is more music, funny enough. We're basically full. We have all the music we can already need and you're competing with the best. Nobody needs new music. How do you, when you want to cultivate that fan base of people who are telling other people about their music, does that have to come down to the quality of music? And of course, that's probably the place to start. But what else can you do to create your music, to create something in your music that will inspire other people to tell people about it? So, Zach, I've known you for what, 20 years now? Off and Something on. like that. I think my entire life. <laughs> you don't make music. You make meaning. Your entire career is about making meaning, not music. If you go look at videos of those uh, teenage girls at Shea Stadium in 1964, or you go look at the punks walking through London with their haircuts, or you go look, whatever music fan moment you wanna think of, they're not acting that way because they are hearing notes that mean something. They're acting that way because in that moment, they have an identity. They're with people. People like us do things like this. We don't have too much of that. We have a shortage of that that too often people are making a song to fill out an album or a song to get on the radio. That's not what we need musicians to do. We need musicians to make our life better, to connect us, to lead us, to make us cry. And we're never gonna run out of a need for that. Absolutely. Okay, you famously basically ignore social media um, you have your blog and your, you post on Twitter, but you famously don't comment ever on Twitter. I'm stressed out personally that I'm not taking advantage of what's available on TikTok to gain an audience. I'm curious why you don't hire someone to figure out how to TikTok your blog. Or to me, that seems easy to do. And you could build a whole new audience on TikTok. Maybe, maybe that's not the point. How do you know when to double down on what you're doing? And how do you know when to start looking into other platforms? Would you ever consider moving to another medium? What would it take to get you to switch? So you're looking at the entire payroll of my company right now. This is all of us, me. I write every word, I do the work myself. I like that. My job is not to be better known. My job is to narrate and help change the people who are enrolled in a journey who have already signed up to be part of this. I am not looking for people for my writing. I'm looking for writing for my people. I have enough people. And I decided that nine years ago, and that has been enormously freeing because I don't work for TikTok and I don't work for Twitter and I don't even work for WordPress. I work for my readers and I am mutually enrolled with them. So could you find a new platform, Clubhouse or TikTok or whatever you want? Of course you could. Go find one and sit there and nurture it and use it the way you want to use it, not the way its shareholders want you to use it. But don't then run off to the next one because then you'll just be mediocre at everything. Instead say, I am idiosyncratic, worth seeking out. There is no substitute and this is where I am. 
And so Bob Dylan decided to live on a bus and he decided to go from city to city for how many years in a row to play in a certain kind of venue, a certain kind of music. And people say, well, doesn't it bum you out that you know you don't have the kind of cultural currency you had in 1967? Because he probably could figure it out. But no, he wants to make music for the people he's making music for. And an interesting trivial aside, his biggest hit ever was this year, last year, because all of his fans bought that endlessly long song, all listened to it on streaming all at the same time. Um, but that's an aside that sort of undermines my point. My point is, whichever platform you pick, you find your people. I found my people, so I'm not looking for a new platform. Okay, fair enough. But could you, but if you're coming up now, if you're still trying to find your platform, oh, yeah. I run a newsletter, I host this podcast. Is my approach, do you think, to double down on my growing newsletter and my podcast? Or do I have to still find my platform and maybe I should branch out and, and jump onto TikTok? Well, so you're not the next left sits because we already have a left sits. Right, exactly. But we're not gonna have a left sits forever. And the point is you approach this with a totally different point of view and with a different kind of generosity and energy than Bob does. So the thing is when people like us do things like this, when musicians or industry people are talking to each other, do any of them bring you up? And when they bring you up, what do they say? And when the person who hears that feels left out, left behind, where do they go to get on your train, right? That's the story. You got to find a platform where you can do that. And it, you know, it really doesn't matter. It's a moment in time. So Esther Dyson, you know, started an old fashioned newsletter and an old fashioned conference in the 1980s. But everyone who was anyone had to go to the release conference because she was the person who determined who was anyone. And so the same thing is true now that this new generation, the streaming generation is coming up. You're the narrator for the people in that music industry. You just need to find a place to put your stake in the ground. I don't think it makes sense for you to go chase one new social media platform after another. You could add another one. You could have a show on Clubhouse. I don't care, but you got to limit it because otherwise you don't create enough value. Okay, this is a good tip. I like this because I'm stressed out about not being on TikTok, but maybe it's okay. I thought you were stressed out about playing the guitar. You're stressed out about both? I've got a lot of stresses in my life. Seth. Why don't no, you play the guitar on TikTok? On tic tic Guitar is going viral on TikTok right now. So this might be my moment to, to do just that. Do you still study the Alexander technique? I, th I If I remember correctly, you were at one point. Am I right. wrong about this? Or no, it's great. I did it for eight years. And then my teacher moved to Hong Kong. And five years later, I felt like I really needed it. And I looked on the web and she had moved back. So I did it with her for eight more years. And now I just do it for myself. It, I strongly advise people, go to two sessions and see if it changes the way you breathe and walk. I, it, so was, it was a gift. I am obsessed with the Alexander technique. I think it is the reason I am mobile, quite literally, because I had horrible tendonitis in both my wrists. My neck, everything was horrible from playing guitar, trying to get into college. I literally think the Alexander Technique saved my life. I'm obsessed with it. I have never been able to talk anyone into going to an Alexander class. And when I talk to people who have chronic pain, horrible back issues, I've never convinced anyone they look at me like I'm crazy. How do you pitch this? How could the Alexander community pitch this? I will. So first, let's understand this metaphor is so important because this is how we decide everything that people like us do things like this. That's too flaky. I'm not going to do that. Well, bridging that gap, you don't get the masses all at once. You got to get the, the people who are searching, the early adopters, the people who are looking for something. And then you have to understand where status lies in our culture, right? Because if people feel like they're falling behind, if people feel like they're aging prematurely, if people feel like they're getting left out, they want to solve that problem. So how would I solve this if I was uh, the head of the Alexander, whatever it is? <laughs> um, I would start doing classes in public and I would start doing them um, for people to watch online the same way when Jane Fonda first started doing her aerobics thing and the 10 minute workout people started. The fact that you could watch other people doing it 
normalized it. And also the fact that you saw them having fun made you want to do it. So, uh, you know, going to somebody's house, walking up to the second floor of their house into this little room and stuff, that's a little flaky, but I'm a little flaky. So I was okay with it. Um, but it probably deserves a little bit bigger audience than that. Does that mean if you're an Alexander Tech teacher, do you set up in, in Central Park? What yeah. does that mean? Do you go live? You yeah. literally you would set up a table in Central Park yeah. and start practicing the Alexander technique. <laughs> exactly. Yes, that's exactly what I would do. Maybe I could pitch this to my teacher in New York and see if she'll do it with me. We'll, we'll take a trip over one day. Yeah. How important to you are titles? Your titles, your subtitles and chapters, your titles of your podcast, Akimbo, Bradley Cooper has a cold, maybe my favorite title in the practice. <laughs> How much do you labor over these? How much, I mean, like I'm reading right now the Joseph Sugarman copyright book. And I'm sort of looking about how everything is to get you to read the first sentence. And I feel like your titles accomplish that. How much effort do you put into coming up with your titles? You're the first person I've met in a very long time who's reading the Joe Sugarman copyright. Should I be reading this? Because I feel like nobody's reading this either. I'm fascinated by it. Is that the right book to be reading for copywriting? You, you have to take it with a grain of salt. So here's the time I met Joe Sugarman. So Joe Sugarman used to run these ads in marginal magazines right. about blue blocker sunglasses and all sorts of uh, not very effective crap that you could buy for $20. It was like an infomercial on TV. And it all came with a money back guarantee and the copy was totally over the top. And I went to see him give a talk. And afterwards I'm like, uh, what's up with the stuff that you're selling and the claims that you're making? And he said, well, here's what I do. Everything comes with a money back guarantee. And if at least 10 people, 10% 10 of the people don't ask for their money back, I know I'm not making big enough claims. So he was writing to intentionally annoy, offend, and disappoint more than 10% of the people who bought from him because he was in the hyperbole business. And so I learned a lot. He was a nice guy, but I learned a lot from that in that I don't want to be in the hyperbole business. And so you will never, ever see me write something like, this will change your life, or here's how to make a million dollars in four weeks. Not my business. That's not what I do. What I try to do is to say with a blog post title, and then from there into the other things I've titled, knock, knock. And I want people to say, who's there? Because we understand how a knock-knock joke works. And if I say knock-knock and you say who's there, now I have an invitation. I have an invitation to begin us on a journey. And so, yes, my favorite, I think, ever is Bradley Cooper has a cold as well, because that's a magical way to say knock-knock. So what is the book to read for copywriting? If you want to learn how, how did you learn how to become a great copyright? Is it from the blog post and just writing every single day? So my friend Margot is a much better copywriter than I, and she's busy building a workshop on copywriting. But um, I think that um, there's nothing wrong with reading Sugarman. There's nothing wrong with reading Herschel Gordon Lewis. Herschel Gordon Lewis is probably a better place to start. Interesting trivia about Herschel Gordon Lewis before he wrote some of the best books on copywriting, he wrote slasher movies like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Go figure. Okay, that's going to be my next read. I'm liking the Sugarman books, but I feel like they're a little dated. They're a little, they're not quite what I'm looking for, but there are, I've gotten some takeaways from it. So I, I'm, I'm liking it. Okay, you are a gadgeteer. I don't know if that's a word, but every time I'm at your house, there's a new gadget, a new toy, something. And you were also a master chef I'm curious if, you know, people are bored in quarantine, they want to buy something fun and they want a cool ingredient, let's say. Coolest gadget thing, item that someone could go and buy and coolest ingredient, snack, food that someone could order online and check out. Okay. Uh, coolest gadget arrived today. It is a little metal round disc with a hidden pin in it. And when you put an egg in it and push down, it puts the tiniest little hole in the bottom of your egg. And so for $8 for the rest of your life, every time you make soft or hard boiled eggs, that weird dimple won't be there. That's what the hole does. That's what the hole does. 
now deliciousness wait where do you where do you get that what how do you search that whole egg uh, popper yeah, it's called a it's not a popper it's a piercer it's called an egg piercer an egg piercer okay yes. uh i'm gonna give you two tasty food advice pieces first for the first time ever i am pleased to say in public that by the way, Bakery's Mo Mix is now available for shipment around the United States. This is iconic. It, it's the world famous Mo Mix, and it's now in a bag, and it's delicious. You can find the links to buy it at um, uh, what's the URL? Oh no! Uh, by, by the way, way, Bakery. Go to bythewaybakery.com. And there's a link to go to the Shopify store where you can buy Momix. This is my base of the food pyramid. I grew up on Momix. It's this very special. Is, this is a special product. Okay, so Momix is the one. And then you said you had another. A company called Burlap and Barrel will sell you spices like you have never had in your life. Ethically sourced, pay a little bit extra, get way more than you pay for. Tell them I sent you. I have every item Burlap and Barrel has ever made. Okay, this is good. I'm going to look into all three of these. Final question, Seth. Okay. You started out as an entrepreneur, creating businesses. Now you're obviously much more known as an author and a teacher. Could you have become an author and a teacher without having the entrepreneur background? If you had said early on, my path is to be a teacher and an author, could you have started sooner? Or did you need those experiences in order to have to validate what you talk about today? When I was 26 years old, Chip Conley and I wrote a book called Business Rules of Thumb. And um, it, Chip has gone on to write a bunch of bestsellers and so have I. The barrier to show up with insight for people who want it has never ever been lower than it is right now. And the whole idea is to help 10 people. I don't care if you do it in video or audio or print or by going for walks with people. If you can help 10 people, you're a teacher and an author. Can you make a living at it? That's a different question. And that question is more about celebrity than it is about the quantity or quality of your advice. But it really helps if you've got good advice before you start going down the road of trying to be a teacher. Do you think when you write a book, and I think a lot of the things you write about are things that you can spend your whole life perfecting, but do you feel like you're an expert at everything? Do you ever consult what you write in your books? Do you ever go back for wisdom? Oh, those are two advice? different questions. The, uh, my question is, do, do you ever go back to your books for advice? If you're stuck, do you say, what did I write 10 years ago? Yeah. Do you ever so, reference them for help? So the, the first thing that I got to make really clear to people is I make this stuff all up. <laughs> I'm not like Isaac Newton, who has somehow been whispered to by the gods of physics. I just say, I'm making an assertion. If it works for you, you should pursue it. But I'm no expert. On the other hand, I listen to audiobooks of me all the time because that reminds me of the person I used to be. And it reminds me of what I ought to try to aspire to in terms of not being a hypocrite and getting back to the journey I want to be on. So I'm hoping that if it works for me, it works for other people. But mostly when I'm writing, I'm writing for someone like me, and sometimes specifically me. And the best tip if you want to be a writer, start a blog. Stand, do you still stand by that? If you want to be a writer, you have to write. I don't care where you write, but you need to write. And writing a blog is as good as place as any. Okay. And if you hate the Grateful Dead, where should you start to try to get into the Grateful Dead? <laughs> I, if you hate the Grateful Dead, it's almost certain because you haven't actually listened to the Grateful Dead. The Grateful Dead do math and jazz, and they sometimes are a little bit sloppy, but not often. And um, I think that if you just um, get past the t-shirts and the smoke and listen to any of Dick's picks or Dave's picks, take your time. Listen to a little bit of it. You don't need any other substances around. You can just say, oh, I see what you did there. Because if you want to understand how to organize and lead a tribe, come up with a genre on your own, persistently and consistently connect the community to one another, be an impresario, own your own rights, chart a path and stick with it consistently for a lifetime. I got no better examples for you than the dead. The dead will end it there. Seth, Thank you so much for taking the time. This was such a blast. Uh, I am very grateful. Thank you so much.
You're the best. Long, strange trip, man. We'll see you. You're the best. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye.